By day, he was a highly paid neurosurgeon. Yes. By night, he fed his insatiable addiction for girls and cocaine. I just couldn't believe it. To know that he had walked out and left that girl dead in his apartment, that was the biggest shock of all. All that while performing the most intricate operations. You say you keep a close eye on your doctors in the program, but would you say you were keeping a close enough eye on Dr Suresh Nair? Well, not every regulatory system, I think, is uh, necessarily perfect. The deadly cocktail of drugs, sex, surgery and suffering. Welcome to the program. Doctors occupy a privileged and trusted place in our society. Surgeons are at the pinnacle of their profession. People's lives are literally in their hands. Given what's at stake, you'd think patients would have a right to expect that if a surgeon is displaying bizarre and unstable behaviour, then their welfare would be put first. Dr Suresh Nair was a skilled neurosurgeon. He was also a cocaine and sex addict, spending tens of thousands of dollars in a single session with prostitutes. Despite coming to the attention of the New South Wales Medical Board in 2004, and despite efforts to monitor his behaviour, he was still able to practice. It wasn't until he was arrested and charged with murder and manslaughter in late 2009 that he was suspended until his ultimate deregistration. But in the intervening years, Dr Nair had performed hundreds of complex surgical procedures. This joint investigation with Fairfax Media is reported by Tracy Bowden. This is one of the most delicate forms of surgery imaginable. Intricate procedures on the brain and the spine with no room for error. Neurosurgeons are members of an elite club of specialists. The standard of neurosurgery in Australia is very high. The training is very exacting. Having trained in Canada and being a fellow of the college in America as well as Canada and Australia, the standard is extremely high. But what happens when one of these highly trained doctors goes off the rails? Mr Nair, for the purpose of voice identification, would you please state your name, date and birth and address? Uh, it's Suresh Nair, 11th of March 1968 and it's uh, NRRC. Dr Suresh Nair would go from scrubs to prison greens. His activities would contribute to the deaths of two young women from drug overdoses and leave many patients with questions they will never find answers for. I'd ask why, why, why did he do it? You know, he had, he had a duty of care to his patients. Um, I wasn't just a piece of meat, you know, I was a mum, I'm 56 years old and I don't have much of a life. I'm still in disbelief to think that um, that man, you know, was living that horrible life when he was um, operating on patients. Even as a young medical graduate in the early 1990s, Suresh Nair had a reputation. Nicknamed Sex Rash, his Sydney University graduation class yearbook noted, next to medicine, pornography is his passion. Give him a good penthouse and he's happy. While many of the doctors who trained with Suresh Nair were happy to describe his offbeat habits, none were prepared to appear on camera. They paint a picture of a socially awkward figure who disappear for days at a time without explanation, almost ending his medical career before it began. But as this investigation will show, Dr Suresh Nair was given the benefit of the doubt time and time again. After graduating, the Malaysian-born doctor had big ambitions. He wanted to become a neurosurgeon. Professor Michael Besser was chairman of the Board of Neurosurgery, which considered Suresh Nair's application. He had the intelligence, but in my recollection is he had difficulty in interacting with the staff. 
um, and uh, his personality was um, different, uh, perhaps a little bit odd. I think it's fair to say that one of the major reasons he got onto the training program was this thought that he would go back to Malaysia and be a neurosurgeon there. So if he hadn't been planning to go back to Malaysia, if he'd been someone who wanted to stay and work in Australia, what do you think would have happened? Well, I think we would have had doubts about him entering the training program and I, I doubt that he would have got onto the program. Despite such misgivings, Dr Suresh Nair made it through the training program and qualified as a neurosurgeon in 2001. Still in his early 30s, he started working at Nepean Public Hospital at the foot of the Blue Mountains in Sydney's outer western suburbs and at the nearby private hospital. In my opinion, he was a young, talented, good neurosurgeon. His operating skills were good and uh, he was well trained. He seemed motivated. He was very concerned about the patients and patients loved him. They really loved him. Dr. Suresh Nair's colleagues had no idea of the double life he was leading. <laughs> Back in his city apartment, he was splurging on cocaine and prostitutes. I remember it vividly, as it was the single worst experience of my entire life. A former escort would later write about her encounter with Suresh Nair during a booking in 2003, just two years after he started practicing as a neurosurgeon. One more. One more. I told Suresh I hadn't tried coke before, and he pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed for me to keep up with him. He said, don't worry, I'm a surgeon, you're fine, as he did line after line of coke, pushing me to keep up. She recalls becoming so badly affected she could barely move before eventually crawling to the toilet and vomiting. Her nose bled for days afterwards. Not once did Suresh check I was okay. He was only interested in getting me as wasted as him. He couldn't have cared less that I was absolutely terrified. I left after 12 hours and he said he was going to work that day. At Nepean Public Hospital, fellow neurosurgeon Dr Vidya Saga Kasaka was becoming concerned about Dr Nair. I found that he always was to come to the hospital with a sniffing nose and feeling as if he had a cold. Uh, initially I thought he probably had a cold, but when I saw that it was going on for weeks and weeks, I said, that's funny. One doesn't have a cold for such a long time. But when he actually did not turn up to the operating room, which was the scheduled theater, then I thought there was something really wrong with this young man. In early 2004, Dr. Suresh Nair admitted he had a problem with cocaine. He self-reported to the New South Wales Medical Board, now called the Medical Council and entered the program for impaired doctors. The idea of a program like this is to encourage doctors to come early, seek that help and get support, and to be in a system which does propose some monitoring around their potential risk to the public as well, so that they can continue to practice safely with appropriate limits put in. In September that year, the medical board suspended his registration for eight weeks after he failed a urine test. Dr Nair then returned to work and would remain on a drug testing regime for the next four years. We didn't know the depth of the problem. We thought this was just a stress-related, a little bit of drug and things like that, but we didn't know the full uh, spectrum of the problem. I was in excruciating pain. He presented very well. I was very, very impressed at how caring um, he was. When Rhonda Taylor was referred to Dr Suresh Nair with severe lower back pain, 
She had no idea that he was being monitored for drugs. He performed a laminectomy, removing part of the vertebrae to relieve pressure on her spine. It went very well. My disc had actually ruptured and there was fragments um, of, um, of the disc, so we had to remove all of that. Uh, I recovered from that really well. By late 2008, the medical board decided it was safe to end Suresh Nair's drug testing regime. In about September 08, as part of his regular review, the panel at the time decided to cease the drug testing after about four years of testing. But just as the medical board relaxed its conditions, confident that Suresh Nair was back on track, he was struggling with some major personal issues. He'd broken up with his fiancée and requested leave from work. His life was about to spiral out of control. Meanwhile, Rhonda Taylor was again struggling with back pain. I went to see my GP and he referred me again to see Dr Nair, which I had no problem with um, because I was more than happy with the result from my first surgery with him. Twice in October 2008, Dr Suresh Nair cancelled Rhonda Taylor's scheduled operation. She thought it was a case of third time lucky at the end of the month, when she finally made the three-hour journey from her home at Candos in the central west of New South Wales to Nepean Private. The next morning she was prepped and ready for surgery. A lady came in and she said to me, your surgery's been cancelled. And I was just in absolute shock. The unit manager came around to my room and she was very angry with Dr Nair. She apologised and she said he had done the same thing the day prior to my surgery. I was a complete and utter mess by that stage. Um being down there on my own. Over at Nepean Public Hospital, fellow surgeons who'd taken over the care of Suresh Nair's patients while he was on leave raised formal concerns about his clinical judgment. The local area health service took drastic action. His clinical privileges were withdrawn, which essentially means that he was unable to operate and unable to work. And those um, clinical privileges were withdrawn and remain so right through until September 2009. Why for such a long time? Well, he again had health concerns and we have patient safety paramount, so we wanted to make every effort to ensure that he was on the path to rehabilitation again. You say he had health concerns, what do you mean? Well, his cocaine problem had returned. In response to the concerns raised by his colleagues, the New South Wales Medical Board held another hearing into Dr Suresh Nair's fitness to practice. Even though the local public health service had made its own decision to bar him from surgery at the public hospital, the medical board decided Dr Nair could keep operating under revised conditions and supervision. You had a doctor who'd had a history of a drug addiction. You'd stopped the urine testing thinking that he was fine. And then within weeks you're getting colleagues saying they have concerns about him. Were there some red flags at that point? Those questions would have been in the minds of our panel members. Uh, who looked at the situation and talked to Dr Nair at the time and, and made the best decisions they could with the information they had. But certainly there was no suggestion that urine testing should be reintroduced or anything of that nature? The, the panel did not decide to reimpose urine testing. In hindsight, was that a mistake? In hindsight, it, it appears that later on, certainly in 2009, uh, Dr Nair certainly admitted now in the, in the public domain that he uh, started to abuse drugs again. It wasn't just Dr Suresh Nair's fellow surgeons who were sounding the alarm. In late 2008, the Sex Workers Outreach Program put out a red alert to Sydney's escort industry, 
warning of the dangerous activities of a regular client named Suresh. Client alleges that he is a doctor, says that he will pay extra if worker will take drugs with him. If you are using drugs with a client, you can put your health and safety at risk. I was told by a friend that I could come to a party and if I went, there'd be a chance that I'd get a hundred bucks. Um, the guy who was hosting the party apparently really enjoyed the company of, of young women. In February 2009, this young university student we'll call Kathy gained a first-hand glimpse of the neurosurgeon's extreme appetite for cocaine when she was invited to a party at his Elizabeth Bay apartment. He had a plate with a mound of white powdery substance and it was quite forcefully directed in our way and he straight out said, have some, take some, we're here to party. His common statement was, have you ever been so coked up? It's so fun to be full of coke. It's incredibly exciting to be really coked up. The amount of cocaine that was available, the amount of drugs that were, were floating around the apartment was incredible. There was plates and mounds of drugs. Another thing that we noticed quite quickly was the amount of money that was laid out throughout the apartment, in particular on top of the dining table. There was $50 notes, $100 notes, some $20 notes, just spread out all onto the table. And did he offer you cash at any point? He offered us money to consume drugs. When we were constantly declining to take drugs, he would pick up money from the table and hand it to us and be like, take this, take this, and then present us with a plate of drugs and say, take this, take this. You tried this stuff? It's awesome. Kathy found her host's behaviour so disturbing, she decided to leave. What did you think as you were walking away? That we dodged a bullet. Uh, my first thought was that the situation could have got very messy and it could have got really uncomfortable for us. Mm, this one is good. <laughs> Even better with that. It did get messy. Dr Suresh Nair engaged in a marathon session with two sex workers, consuming large amounts of cocaine. Ooh, double time. <laughs> the next morning, HM Escort sent this young woman to his apartment. Victoria McIntyre was 23. She agreed to take cocaine, but within an hour of her arrival, suffered a seizure. Dr. Suresh Nair called an ambulance, which took the young woman to St. Vincent's Hospital. 12 hours later, she was pronounced dead. Victoria McIntyre's cause of death was cocaine toxicity. The level of toxicity was at 7.1 milligrams per litre of blood, which is extremely high. The evidence suggests that uh, the cocaine was not only snorted by Victoria, uh, but also uh, was inserted into other parts of her body. The post-mortem found evidence from rectal swabs as well as nasal swabs of cocaine. When detectives arrived at Suresh Nair's apartment, he was gone. The dishwasher had been running and they could only find minuscule traces of cocaine, which meant there were no obvious grounds for charges. Suresh Nair was not interested in speaking with the police or providing any version of events, as was his right. Um, the investigation continued in the absence of any input from Dr Nair. Dr Suresh Nair didn't inform his employers or the medical board of his involvement in Victoria McIntyre's death. But a couple of weeks later, the New South Wales Police paid a visit to Nepean Public Hospital. The detectives attended Nepean Hospital in person to notify medical staff um, of the concerns that they had and the involvement of Dr Nair in this particular death and also our concerns in relation to his, not only the supply of cocaine, but his addiction to cocaine. Did you inform 
the medical board of that information? Uh, no, there was no advice because, as I've said, um, although there was some informal advice from the police, there was also very shortly following that advice that this wasn't an issue for sh that Charisse needed to answer to or was anyway considered a person of interest. But surely if the medical board is looking after this impaired doctor and you discover that police are investigating a case where a young woman died, isn't that significant? It certainly is a significant issue and for Victoria McIntyre it was obviously you know, a fatal issue. Um, but as I've said, he wasn't at work. There was nothing more that the hospital did at that time. What do you think you would have done if you'd known about that first death back in February? We would have had immediate action hearing and in all likelihood he would have been suspended. Should you have been notified? Well, under the law, there is no obligation for police to notify us. And uh, nor, in fact, under law was there any obligation for a doctor to notify us except in the case of an actual conviction. It's very regrettable we didn't know about Dr Nair's activities earlier. As I said, if we had, we would have taken action. Even though the medical board had cleared Suresh Nair to continue operating under supervision in early 2009, his colleagues at Nepean Public Hospital were not convinced. These internal hospital emails released under freedom of information laws reveal more strong criticism by his fellow neurosurgeons. Suresh does not have the confidence of his colleagues. Inability to function as a consultant. Clinical judgment is often confusing. Decisions regarding surgery are often bizarre. But he continued to perform surgery right next door at Nepean Private Hospital. I had a further booking for the 11th of March um, and that's when my surgery went ahead. The month after Victoria McIntyre's death, Rhonda Taylor had her long-awaited and much cancelled surgery, a spinal fusion. It was not a success. The problem in my leg was, I would say, probably 90% worse than what it was before I went in for the surgery. And once I was up and moving around, um, I was still in um, pain from my back. I had scar tissue growing on the nerve endings and I had um, a disc bulge and pinched nerves on my neck. 7 years. I guess I'm lucky I'm not in a wheelchair. I'm lucky I can still walk. I came out of that surgery, I have to say, 100 times worse than I went in. Dr Suresh Nair performed spinal surgery on Debbie Burns at Nepean Private Hospital in October 2009. After the operation, in increasing pain, she again tried to see her specialist he proposed more surgery. After a series of cancelled appointments, which Dr Suresh Nair's staff said were due to illness, she was losing faith in him. During that consultation, Dr Nair actually blew his nose on a tissue and put it in the top drawer of his desk, which I thought was pretty... I thought it was very, very odd, but that's what he did. I mean, what doctor blows his nose on a tissue and puts it in the top drawer of his desk? He seemed always to be very, very rushed. Always in a hurry. Everything was done at a million miles an hour. By this time, Dr Nair was back working at Nepean Public Hospital after accepting strict conditions over and above those imposed by the medical board. On November the 19th, 2009, Suresh Nair made another party booking for girls and drugs. 
one of the escorts was 22-year-old Brazilian Suelen Dominguez Zalpa. After a two-hour session of sex and cocaine in his apartment, she began to have trouble breathing. Suelen Dominguez Zalpa suffered a cardiac arrest. Dr. Suresh Nair left her for dead and moved elsewhere with the other women to continue the party. Two days later, when Dr. Nair didn't turn up for work, staff at Nepean Private Hospital became concerned and called the police. Detectives at King's Cross attended Dr. Nair's apartment, knocked on his door, could not raise him. When they forced entry, they found the body of Suellen Zorpa in a partially decomposed state. Far away in the Brazilian city of Porto Alegre, Suellen's family received the tragic news. A gente se falava por e-mail, pelo Skype, por telefone, pelo menos uma vez por semana. Eu ligava para ela sempre no sábado de noite aqui, cada domingo ou meio dia lá. Então, a distância física é como se não existisse. Her mother, Solange Dominguez, finds it hard to accept the circumstances of her daughter's death. A mim assim é uma coisa impossível. Eu sei que ela estava lá, mas eu tenho certeza que ela não sabia o que ia acontecer lá. É porque não não fecha com a Suelen. Com toda a história de vida da Suelen desde criança, com tudo que ela foi crescendo, não fecha. Eu acho que ela foi enganada. Porque a Suelen tinha uma coisa assim muito apesar de viajar tanto, né, e ser evoluída em muitos sentidos, ela era muito ingênua. Suresh Nair surrendered to police on November the 22nd. Within days, he was finally suspended by the Medical Board of New South Wales. Mr. Nair, Detective Hefner and I are making inquiries into the, the murder of Sir Ellen Dominique Zuba on the 19th of November 2009 at your apartment, 1521 Elizabeth Bay Road, Elizabeth Bay. Do you understand that? Yes, sir, I do. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> In regards to the allegation of said, what can you tell me about that? Uh, on legal advice, I did not wish to answer. I've been advised not to uh, answer any questions about this matter. The case hit the headlines, and for the first time, Suresh Nair's patients began to find out the truth about their doctor. I just couldn't believe it. I literally threw up the next day in the kitchen. Just threw up out of the blue, just feeling sick, knowing that he was on drugs. I'd had two surgeries done by that man. I thought I knew him well enough to have picked what was going on in his private life. But to know that he had walked out and left that girl um, dead in his apartment, yeah, that's... Um, that was the, the biggest shock of all. Yeah, I still can't believe it. The other shock for patients was the discovery that Dr Suresh Nair was barred from operating at the public hospital for most of 2009. I still can't understand why he can be refused to operate from the public, but he was um, allowed to op operate at the private hospital. How close is the relationship between the public and the private hospitals out here? Uh, we are geographically quite close, but we are very definitely two, you know, separate entities. There was advice provided to the private hospital in both December 2008 and again in April 2009, advising of concerns with regard to Suresh. 
Four Corners has obtained a copy of the second letter from the head of neurosurgery at Nepean Public Hospital to the CEO of Nepean Private. It warns... We have serious concerns about Dr Nair's ability to practice. Dr Nair does not have the confidence of his neurosurgical colleagues. And that the private hospital... May be exposing the patients to a risk. Wouldn't P and Public have been surprised that P and Private didn't do anything about it? I can't comment about the actions that they took or didn't take. HealthScope, which operates more than 40 hospitals across Australia, including the P and Private, declined to be interviewed, but said in a statement that it has no record of receiving the letter. The company says it relied on the decision of the New South Wales Medical Board, which cleared Suresh Nair to resume practice under conditions. Carla Downs took her concerns about Dr Nair to the New South Wales Healthcare Complaints Commission. It took three years to provide official confirmation that he'd operated at the wrong level in her spine. After some toing and froing, they put in writing that Dr Nair had operated on my C5-6 level in my neck when he should have operated on my C4-5 level. And I thought, for three and a half years they've known this, and they kept it from me. We did keep in touch with her and verbally advised her of the position and what was happening, but she wanted written confirmation, and, and of course she didn't. She's. I think she's entitled to that, and as soon as I found out she didn't have that, we wrote to her and explained uh, what our expert neurosurgeon's opinion was on her care. Um, I sp as I said, I spoke to her and um, apologised to her. There's really... Uh, um, it's very unfortunate, and I'm, I'm sorry it happened. But there were even more disturbing details to come. Earlier this year, Fairfax investigative journalist Eamon Duff published details of the business records from Liaisons, one of Sydney's most high-profile licensed brothels. Although the two women who died were not from Liaisons, Dr Suresh Nair was one of the brothel's best customers. What we found was just staggering. He spent almost $120,000 in that brothel in those months between the two deaths. Four Corners has viewed the records which show the neurosurgeon spending tens of thousands of dollars at a time. The cost of a working girl per hour in the room at liaisons at that time was $330 an hour. Now he spent $56,000 over three shifts and a 25, 26 hour period. You've got to do your maths. That's just, it just doesn't add up. The records show a whole series of extra charges worth thousands of dollars for each session, over and above the cost of the escorts. There are a series of code words. So he would pay for sex and cocaine on his credit card and on official room records and on his receipts, the cocaine transactions would show up as either an advance, cash out, uh, tip, and this is how they would mask essentially the sales of the drugs. The evidence which may be inferred from records, financial transactions, etc., we did not found to be conclusive. There was an offer of $20,000 to two sex workers to engage in sexual activity unprotected. Um, so it was not unusual for Suresh Nair to make large offers of money by way of financial transaction or otherwise um, to um, get what he wanted. The records also revealed that Dr Suresh Nair spent more than $2,000 at liaisons on October the 30th, 2008, the day he cancelled scheduled surgery on Rhonda Taylor. I was so close to being done, but now I thank God every day that um, that was cancelled because knowing now what I know what he was doing, 
Um, I could have been a hundred times worse off. In the months between the deaths of Victoria McIntyre and Sue Ellen Dominguez Zalpa, the neurosurgeon's drug-fuelled binges with prostitutes continued to escalate. On the 9th and 10th of April, he spent almost $30,000 in two sessions. In May, just days after his botched operation on Carla Downs, he racked up a bill of almost $20,000. In July, one 14-hour session totaled more than $30,000. And in one marathon booking in September, he spent more than $54,000. There he was in September, 11 days before my back operation, and he's gone and spent $39,000 in a 25-hour sex binge with cocaine. And three days after my operation, he's back in again, spending up big in the brothel with drugs and sex. Um, what state was he in when he operated on me? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? How did he go from walking out of a brothel after 25 hours or even some of the more regular sessions of 10, 11, 12 hours, go home, shower, and then walk into Nepean as though it was a new bright day and, uh, and and perform delicate life-saving operations on, on, on people, on members of the public. How do you do that? So what went wrong? How could a doctor with a known drug addiction who suffered a dramatic relapse continue to operate? You say you keep a close eye on your doctors in the program, but would you say you were keeping a close enough eye on Dr Suresh Nair? Well, not every regulatory system, I think, is necessarily perfect. And we acted uh, with the sort of information that we had. Uh, Dr Nair was able, I think, in hindsight now, we can see that he, at some stage, even under our program, he was still affected by drugs. Uh, he was able to conceal that from us, from his colleagues, from his patients, uh, from his supervisors. But there are no guarantees that, that it couldn't happen again. Well, I think it is possible uh, in exceptional cases where things, uh, where doctors are able to conceal these from us? Well, I think there is a lot to be learned. I mean, I think um, the administration of health um, needs to be looked at and um, uh, the way that the system works. I mean, obviously he had uh, uh, a problem but I think also the system has a problem and um, uh, it's, it's as much a fault of the system as the person. I think people would wonder, you know, wow, how could a brain surgeon get to this stage and still continue to practice? This case also raises serious allegations of illegal drug dealing in Sydney's licensed brothels and escort agencies. Liaisons and the Golden Apple, two of Sydney's most high profile brothels, are operated by the same company. According to the Golden Apple's slick promotional video, clients can expect extras like champagne along with their choice of companion but some insiders allege there's much more on the menu. Until recently, these women worked at the Golden Apple. They say that not only does the brothel provide the services of sex workers to customers, they also supply drugs and tell the escorts to push them. You've got to be a pusher and you've got to be someone who is okay to do that and in certain situations, there comes a point where pushing this onto people will play on your own conscience. Like, it's not something you want to be doing. Like, it kind of gives you, you don't want to be pushing for someone else to buy these drugs that are shit, for starters, um, are affecting other girls, sending people into psychosis. 
Louise, as we'll call her, was a university student when she started working at the Golden Apple. She says workers were expected to take drugs with clients who wanted to party. There was one night when I went into a booking and I remember being really, like, weird at the start because there was cocaine and um, then I woke up in a back room and there was blood and vomit in my mouth and I was turned on my side. It's made a lot of people sick. Um, we've had complaints from clients and the girls have been very sick. Uh, they keep giving the same drugs. When I first started, there were drugs, but not the way I've seen it now. It's just gone out of hand. We've spoken to two escorts who say that it is still going on and that you could buy party packages where you could get drugs at the brothel at the same time as you got girls. It certainly warrants our investigative attention. There's no doubt about that. Um, whether we can get enough evidence to then take proceedings, uh, that's the question that I need to ask. When Four Corners approached the company that runs Liaisons and the Golden Apple, it denied ever procuring or supplying any illegal substances to clients or sex workers. Dr Suresh Nair served more than four years behind bars after pleading guilty to one count of manslaughter and two of supplying drugs. His parole date was July the 31st, but the Immigration Minister Scott Morrison cancelled his visa and Dr Nair is expected to be deported to the country of his birth, Malaysia. While he has the opportunity for a fresh start, the same can't be said for those still suffering as a consequence of his actions. Um cirurgião deveria salvar vidas, né? A Suelen não teria morrido. Então, para ela tanto faz o quanto tempo ele pegar, porque ela não vai voltar. Mas isso evitaria de outras pessoas passarem pelo que eu tô passando. The things that I have found out, what that man has done, I had put all my trust and faith in him to operate on me for the second time. I can't explain how devastated I am. It was just like it was two completely different men. The impact Dr Nair and I will also say Nepean Private Hospital have had on my life is they've taken my life away for six years now I've had no life I exist from day to day Four years after Suresh Nair's conviction and on the eve of this story going to air, the New South Wales Minister for Health issued a statement promising to change legislation to encourage greater transparency with regard to doctors found to be impaired. That didn't take long. That's the program for tonight. Next week on Four Corners, the story of the woman dubbed the White Widow. Raised in relative affluence, Samantha Luthwaite is now one of the world's most wanted terrorist suspects. Until then, good night.